And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, I'm your host, Robert Picto. Hospice Palliative Care provides medical services, emotional support, and spiritual resources for people who have illnesses that do not go away and often get worse over time for people who are in the last stages of serious illnesses such as cancer or heart failure. Hospice Palliative Care also helps family members manage the practical details and emotional challenges of caring for a dying loved one. On today's Open Connection, we begin the conversation with the word palliative. What comes to your mind when you hear or see the word palliative? Many people, appropriately, think of words such as compassion, dignity, or quality of life. However, for many people, what comes immediately to mind are the words dying, terminal, and end of life. Unfortunately, too few people think of palliative care alongside treatments to control the disease. I'm Dr. Gordon Giddings. I'm a palliative physician at the University of Ottawa and clinical content editor of Pallium Canada. The aim of this Pallium Doodle is to explain that palliative care is not something for just the last days or weeks of life, but should be initiated much earlier. To better understand this, let's look at the illness trajectory starting at the time of diagnosis of a life-threatening illness. In some cases, the disease, whether it be cancer or another non-cancer disease, can be cured with treatments. In other cases, however, the disease may be incurable. Let's draw a graph around this journey. On the x-axis is the length of that journey from diagnosis to death. On the y-axis is the goals of care, the treatment and care options and focus. Now, unfortunately, because people often think of palliative care only for the last days or weeks of life, they will only activate a palliative care approach in the last days or weeks of life. Let's look at the negative consequences of this. They include lack of symptom control with unnecessary suffering, inappropriate treatment choices, prolonged psychological distress because no one is addressing the fears and concerns of the patient, lack of discussions about prognosis, or lack of preparation regarding care choices and treatment goals. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to erase the old model of palliative care and use a different model, a different approach. What if we start palliating early in the illness? This does not mean that treatments to control or cure the disease and palliation and supportive care are mutually exclusive. The model of early palliative care is much more patient-centered and responsive to patient needs. Is there evidence to show that early palliative care is better than late palliative care? In a large U.S.-based study by Timmel and colleagues, the model of early palliative care was compared to the usual or common model of palliative care, only in the late phase of disease. What do you think the results were? Which group do you think did better? Which group had less depression and less anxiety? Which group had better quality of life and symptom control throughout their illness? Which group do you think lived longer? The early palliative care group experienced significantly less depression and anxiety, better quality of life, better symptom control, and astoundingly, they lived almost three months longer than those patients who received only late palliative care. So the key message is palliative care early is better than palliative care late. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. The first known example of a panel show in the world is the radio program Information Please, which debuted in 1938. The evolution of the quiz show format, Information Please, added a key element of a panel of celebrities, largely writers and intellectuals, but also actors and politicians. Let us return to the conversation with the panel show of Palliative Myths. 
Welcome, 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 folks. Tonight's show, we'll look at myths related to palliative and end-of-life care. And our judges, the wisest of the wise, the savviest of the savvy, we have brought them from across the country. A leading doctor, a renowned nurse, a distinguished social worker, and a famous researcher. Without further ado, bring on the first myth. Myth number one, palliative care is only for the last days and weeks of life. Palliative care is not only for the last days and weeks of life. It should start much earlier. Patients experience symptoms and quality of life issues throughout the illness right from the time of diagnosis. Palliative care should, at the very least, start as soon as the disease is deemed to be progressive and incurable. When done earlier, it is done alongside treatments to control the disease. Research shows that starting palliative care early and not waiting for the last days and weeks of life results in a better quality of life, reduced depression and anxiety, and in some cases, a longer life expectancy. Palliative care should start early when a disease is found to be serious and life-threatening. Makes sense. Our next myth, starting palliative care means I'm dying. As we've just heard, palliative care is not restricted only to the end of life. Many people would benefit from palliative care long before they are in the terminal phase. Palliative care means focusing on improving quality of life and engaging in important discussions, no matter how long one has to live. And don't forget, palliative care when started earlier can be done alongside treatments to control the disease. Enough of this negative talk. Starting palliative care early means many more months of better quality of life. On to our next myth. Palliative care starts when there is no further active treatment available. Palliative care is very active care. It requires treating symptoms using different medications and approaches, treating complications of the disease, making the right choices between different treatments and care goals, providing psychological and social support, and providing spiritual care. These are all active treatments. Although controlling the disease may not be always possible, there is always a lot of active care to be done. Palliative care is active care. Okay, next, starting palliative care means giving up. Well, that depends on what you mean by giving up. When cure or control is still possible, palliative care is done alongside treatments that try to cure or control. When neither cure nor control is possible, palliative care becomes the main focus of care and is ongoing and active. It's not about giving up. Starting a palliative care approach means that care continues. And now, our final myth for the evening, palliative care means getting doped up with morphine until the end. Let's make it clear. Firstly, morphine and other opioids are safe and effective medications when used appropriately to treat pain. The goal is to control pain and have a person clear of mind. Secondly, if a patient does become sedated as a result of using morphine or other medications, it would be a side effect that needs to be resolved. And thirdly, becoming increasingly sleepy and fatigued is a normal process of dying. Too often, morphine or other medications are blamed for this when they are actually innocent. When sedation is needed, which is the case in some situations at the very end of life, sedative medications are used, not morphine. The goal of palliative care requires effective and judicious use of medications. Well, that concludes our palliative myths for tonight. Be sure to tune in next time when we examine five more myths associated with palliative care. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Canadians are living longer, but they're not always living better. For many people, living longer means they struggle with poor health caused by chronic conditions, degenerative diseases, or cancer. Thanks to improved medical treatments, declines in health are now more gradual. 
let us return to the panel show of Palliative Myths. Hi everyone, welcome back to Palliative Myths. Tonight, we'll be taking a look at five more myths related to palliative and end-of-life care. We're once again joined by our panel of prestigious judges. A leading doctor, a renowned nurse, a distinguished social worker, and a famous researcher. Let's get started. Bring out our first myth. Palliative care is only for the elderly. Uh, I know we're just getting started, but do you judges mind if I try this one? Go for it. Well, it seems to me that life-threatening and life-limiting illnesses occur across all age groups. Although more common in older people, younger people also develop progressive and curable illnesses. Correct. Correct. You got, you got it. it. Palliative care, care is applicable, applicable for all ages. all ages. Thanks for letting me jump in there. Bring out the next myth. Palliative care is just for patients with cancer. Palliative care is applicable for many different diseases, not only cancer. This includes advanced heart, lung, kidney, and neurological diseases such as dementia and ALS, amongst others. Palliative care is for all life-limiting illnesses, cancer or non-cancer. Our next myth? Palliative care is done only by palliative care specialist teams. All health professionals who care for someone with a life-threatening and life-limiting illness should know the essentials of good palliative care. Family doctors, nurses, oncologists, cardiologists, pharmacists should all have training. We cannot rely only on a small number of palliative care specialists to provide palliative care. Palliative care is the responsibility of all health professionals who, in the course of their work, provide care to patients with life-threatening and life-limiting illnesses. Next, everyone has access to good palliative care. That's definitely untrue. Only 16 to 30 percent of Canadians have access to palliative care, and most of them only receive palliative services within the last days and weeks of life. Work still needs to be done by health services across the country to fully integrate palliative care and ensure access to palliative care. And now, our final myth of the night. And it's a doozy. People are immortal. <gasps> Everyone dies someday, and today, sudden death is much less common than it once was. The World Health Organization states that in Canada, chronic diseases are projected to account for 89% of all deaths. That one is definitely busted. No one is immortal. That concludes tonight's Palliative Myths. Thanks to our judges, audience, and those of you who tuned in from home. Be sure to keep an eye out for upcoming videos from Pallium Canada at www.pallium.ca. Good night, everybody. We're in Reading Terminal Market, which is our favorite place to have lunch in Philadelphia. And we're going to get people together like we do on the final Friday of every month to play My Gift of Grace, which is a game that helps anybody have better conversations about end of life. Write down any fears you have about playing this game. My fear is that I'm not going to be understood. <laughs> <laughs> This is serious fun, and it's thought-provoking. It left me feeling great. It just reinforces a lot and helps you figure out stuff for yourself. It is absolutely the most connecting game that I think I've ever stumbled upon. It's funny because it's about this topic that most people try and avoid talking about, but it, it opens up a, a window, and avenue for you to actually be able to talk about yourself in a way that expresses your values, expresses your principles, it kind of lays out who you are as a person. And it's also a very interesting and insightful to hear the responses. One is if you're in pain, time doesn't mean anything anymore. It stops moving, everything is right there. So we start talking about funerals. He's, I hit people, I said, oh, what, that's what I can do with your ties. I'll get all your ties and I'll hand them out. <laughs> at your way so that all the, to all the men so that first of all they're dressed for the occasion because they'll be like that guy couldn't throw on a tie this guy died and he can't throw on a tie people who just met for the first time within an hour developed a relationship and I think that's what's great about this game it provides that environment provides that 
the venue to have these discussions, which are very important and powerful. You don't feel judged by the next person. You actually feel supported as a group. I was I was surprised at how quickly that could happen. She loved being a mother with an exclamation point. Oh. Thank you. Said she was not a jogger. You don't want to be listed as a jogger if you're a runner. So. Oh, you're a runner. Thank you for making me laugh. I was going to say I'll drink to that. But not being a runner or a jogger. I'll hold on to later. Okay, who's next? I have to read. Okay. Who haven't you talked with in more than six months that you would want to talk with before you die? Oh, six six months. So simple questions causing me to think very deeply. I want to use it with my family, my friends, my patients. Everybody should have these conversations. And what a great way. It's fun and non-threatening. Especially after this, I just wish I could hug her. Tell her that. She lives in Sweden. In Sweden. Yeah. Let's call her up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So many of the questions here are talked about people's fears and people's values. And, and these are very important questions that we actually need to incorporate in healthcare so we can provide the care that people actually want. It's a very, very powerful tool that works well in a lot of different settings and seems to me that it's a, one of the ways in which we can start to change the conversation that takes place. It's really, really fun. It was a great game. I had a lot of fun. And I won the game. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Great conversations inspire, connect, and heal. Too often, conversations about what matters most of us are avoided in healthcare, but also in our daily lives. In this final segment of Open Connection, let's begin the conversation with hello. We are at the Plaintree International Conference of Patient Center Care and we just played a game called Hello. Hello is a conversation game about living and dying and what matters most to each of us. The experience, I would say, is probably the best part of playing Tree Conference so far. Um, I'm not expecting it to get a whole lot better than this, actually, because it was really amazing. It brought a table of about 10 of us together. We didn't know each other prior to the game, but with the game's purposes, it's to facilitate difficult conversations in, a, in an easy way. I was laughing when the person came around at lunch and said, hey, come play a game. And I said, okay, are there prizes? Because I'm out to win. And I actually won at my table. So it was fun. But beyond that, it was more about, hey, these are really important questions. Have I asked myself them before? They were incredibly thought provoking. A lot of it related to end of life care or some of your wishes that maybe some younger folks haven't put much thought into. And what would happen is you'd answer the question and then immediately you start to think about why well, did I answer it that way or you know what would happen if who haven't you talked with in more than six months that you'd want to talk with before you died it makes you more reflective on what you want I don't know if there was a favorite question each and every one of them made you think some of the things that you would never think about with an end-of-life discussion or advanced care planning is a type of music do you want to hear if you're in the hospital? I put like some ACDC, Bon Jovi, my like Sweet Home Alabama. <laughs> I mean, I just kind of like that kind of music. So why would I listen to anything different? This is Hello. It's a game about living and dying and what matters most to each of us. When you play, you'll have a conversation about the things that are important to you. And you'll get to hear about what is important to the people you care about. Hello is simple to learn and can be played by anyone. In this video, we're going to show you how to play Hello. Let's start by setting up the game. Each player starts with a questions booklet, a pen, and an equal number of these blue chips. These are called thank you chips, and we'll show you how they're used in a moment. Before you begin to play, flip a coin and hide it under the scoring card. Make sure that none of the players see whether this coin is heads up or tails up. At the end of the game, you'll reveal this coin. 
If it is tails up, the player with the fewest thank you chips will be the winner. If it is heads up, the player with the most thank you chips will win. If you're playing hello at an event, the host will flip a coin for the whole room, so you don't need to flip one at each table. Here's how thank you chips work. At any time during the game, if someone does or says something that you appreciate, give them a chip. You can give a chip for any reason, and you can explain why you're giving a chip to another player, or you can just give them a chip and leave it at that. If someone gives you a thank you chip, add it to your stack. The rules of hello are simple. Rule number one, and this is the most important rule, is to listen. Rule number two, you can pass on any turn if you don't want to share the answer you write down. Rule number three, there are no wrong answers. Rule number four, you can change your answer at any time, even after a turn has passed. You can even come back and change your answer next week, or in a month, or the next time you play hello. Rule number five, you can give a thank you chip to anyone at any time during the game. And if you work in healthcare, we have a bonus rule for you. Rule number six, leave your credentials at the door. Don't worry about how your patients or anyone else might play this game. Just play as yourself. Now, let's see how one turn of hello is played. At the start of a turn, everyone opens their questions booklet to the same question. You'll go in order and start with question one. One player reads the question out loud. After the question is read, each player silently writes their answer to the question in their questions booklet. When you're done writing, put your pen down. This is the signal to other players that you are done with your answer. Stay silent until all players have put their pens down. Then, the player who read the question reads their own answer out loud, or they can choose to pass. Proceed clockwise, with each person either reading their answer or passing. Once everyone has had a chance to read their answer, you can discuss your answers if you like. Then, turn to the next question in your booklet. Any player can read the next question out loud to start the next turn. And that's how you play Hello. It's simple. Now, we'll show you how to end the game. There are several ways to end a game of Hello, but the easiest is just to choose how long you want to play before you start the game. When time is up, finish the question you're on, and then count your chips. Then, turn over the scoring card to find out who the winner is. If the coin is tails up, the player with the fewest chips is the winner. If it is heads up, the player with the most chips has won. In the event of a tie, two or more players can win a game of Hello. You can play Hello over and over again. Your answers will probably evolve and change, and you'll learn new things about yourself and other players. Start your next game of Hello with questions 1 and 2, and then jump to the next unplayed question to continue. You can also carry your questions booklet around with you to answer questions on your own, change your answers, or ask questions of your friends and family outside of the game. And that's everything you need to know to play a game of Hello. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictel. Thank you.